Hello, friends from all over. Welcome to today's masterclass, Experiments in Digital Theater. My name is Gavin Dahay Trinidad, he, him, his, and I am New York Theater Workshop's Community Engagement Associate, and we are broadcasting from Zoom and simultaneously streaming on YouTube. And I am so stoked for today. So uh, let's start with our land acknowledgement. New York Theater Workshop has sought to create art that interrogates our past as a way of understanding the present and shining light toward the future. So to that end, we are taking the time to recognize the history of the land we occupy in the East Village. And as we find ourselves in the digital space, we'd like to embrace this opportunity to acknowledge the many native lands from which we're all tuning in. We are posting a link in the chat where you can learn about the tribal history of the land on which you are situated. And we invite everyone to take a moment to input your address in the website and post in the chat the native land from which you are joining us. And I will do that now. Awesome. One moment. And so this following land acknowledgement was written in collaboration with Safe Harbors NYC. Manhattan has always been a gathering and trading place for the many indigenous peoples where nations intersected from all four directions since time in memorial. It was a place to gather and sometimes to seek refuge during times of conflict and struggle. So we pay respect to all of their ancestors present, a past, present, and to future generations. We acknowledge that New York Theater Workshop is situated on the island of Manhattan, uh, Menohanet, on the island, traditional lands of the Munsee Lenape, the Canarsi, the Unkachug, the Matinecock, the Shinnecock, the Regawank, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We respect that many indigenous people continue to live and work on this island and acknowledge their ongoing contributions to this area. Also, from deep within my heart, I want to thank everyone for attending and being community with us. I know for the this past year and the, particularly the past two weeks um, have been very challenging. And I just want to remind everyone that the news impacts everyone differently. And I encourage you to be gentle with yourself and practice self-accountability and self-care. This workshop is part of New York Theater Workshop's virtual programming series, which is all free and available to the entire community. And if you are in a position to do so, we hope you would consider making in honor of our guests to the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund and or New York Theater Workshop to support ongoing pro programming. The Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund is a national organization founded in 1974, and the organization protects and promotes the civil rights of Asian Americans. You will find a link to donate to the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund and NYTW in the chat on Zoom and in the comments on YouTube. Uh, cool. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our spectacular guests. I would love to first introduce Ada Westfall. Ada is a composer, multi-instrumentalist, music director and performer, and proud transgender woman whose mission is to disrupt, interrogate, and diversify the field of musical theater. Notable works include Heather Christian's I Am Sending You the Sacred Face, Another Rose, Big Apple Circus in the Green, David Burns, jo David Burns Joan of Arc, Into the Fire, Rimbaud in New York, Songbird, and The Last Goodbye. Ada has been an associate artist with Theater Me Too since 2006, collaborating on many shows, including Remnant, its digital adaptation, Death of a Salesman at BAM, and a play on war for which Ada was nominated, the 2010 Drama Desk for Outstanding Music in a Play. Ada, please. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> And I would love to introduce Alex Hawthorne. Alex is an artist, composer, and technologist based in Los Angeles and Brooklyn who utilizes experimental sound design and composition with elements of photography, videography, and other forms of digital media to interrogate notions of archive, memory, and time. 
as an associate artist with Theater Me Too for over 10 years. His theatrical work has been heard across North and South America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. And in 2020, he won an Obie Award for his design as part of the creative team for A Strange Loop. Welcome to you both. We're so happy you could be here. And please take the room. Thank you so much. Um, hi, Alex. Hello. It's good to Hello. see you. <laughs> It's good to see you too. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for for coming to our masterclass. Uh, and thank you to New York Theatre Workshop for hosting us. Um, we are uh, here joining you as, uh, as sort of emissaries from uh, our, our theater company, uh, Theater Me Too, um, with whom we're, we're, we've both been company members for uh, quite a bit of time now. Um, and uh, we just love to take a second and tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, my name is Ada Westfall. I use she, her pronouns, as you can see from my little, I don't know if I'm pointing at it, one of my little name spots. Um, and uh, I function um, a lot of different ways within the theater, um, but I'd say uh, primarily as a musician. Um, uh, I sort of, I'd say if you were to like, tell me in one word what you do, I would say that I'm a songwriter, uh, mostly. Um, but one of the lovely things about, uh, Theater Me Too and the work that we do is we are a, uh, a company that specializes and, and maintains a deep interest in transdisciplinary, uh, practice. So, um, both with Me Too and outside of the Theater Me Too, um, I hop around to a lot of different gigs. So I, I function as a music director, as a composer, as an actor, as a video editor sometimes. And in this case, what we'll be talking about today. Um, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, Alex, would you like to talk a little bit about you? Sure. Um, sort of similarly, yeah, within the sort of larger theatrical realm, I would say, uh, People mostly know me as a sound designer for theater, um, but uh, within the context of the company, that really expands outwards into uh, works of uh, lighting design and technical uh, sort of direction and technical management, um, sometimes stage management, um, and performance, sort of one of the only companies that can actually get me on, on stage and in front of people uh, saying words out loud. Um, and you're beautiful when you do it. <laughs> and I'm always nervous when I do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, in addition to my theatrical work, I'm also pursuing an MFA at Cal Arts, which I began in the fall, um, which was sort of serendipitous in this time of, of being unable to gather around theatrical spaces. Um, and yeah, I mean, Remnant, um, it was your first show with Me Too Hair. Uh, yes, yes, it yeah. was. So we both. Our first show was 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 Hair, which was a production at NYU back in two thousand and six, I believe. Uh, two thousand and yeah, yeah two thousand and six, mm -hmm. fall of two thousand and six. So we're coming up on uh, fifteen years with the company this this August September. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and frankly, theater me too has been so close to my heart, uh, that entire time. It really feels like, even though, you know, I'm in LA, right. Uh, well, not currently in LA, currently I'm in Brooklyn, but, um, usually I'm in, I'm in LA, uh, and theater me too still feels like an artistic home away from home for me. And, uh, really such a joy doing the work that, that we've been doing with the company. Um, so yeah, should we, uh. Should we launch into it? Yeah, let's hop into it. So uh, first of all, you know, thank you for coming to our class. Uh, uh, we are here to talk about experiments in digital theater, uh, uh, sort of as an umbrella term. And specifically, we're going to be talking about um, our, ad our company's adaptation of our own company's piece, uh, Remnant, which when we performed it uh, in person was written as just Remnant and, you know, just the word. And then um, when we uh, did it, um, when we adapted it digitally for uh, New York Theatre Workshop's uh, 2020 sort of digital COVID <laughs> season, um, we uh, we sort of denote that by putting it in little, um, I still don't remember what we call these things. Carrots, right? Carrots, okay. yeah, yeah, carrots, like HTML code. Um, so uh, basically, I'm going to let Alex talk for, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let give you the privilege of talking uh, for uh, for a bit. And, and he's going to sort of give you some context about the show and start talking about Me Too's um, larger creative process. And then we'll we'll uh, do a little switch over afterwards. And I'm going to do sort of like a, a case study about one particular chunk of the show. Um, and, uh, and then we'll take some questions at the end. Um, as we go, uh, if you, if you like, you can pop questions into, um, 
the little Q and A panel, um, and and we will do our best to uh, to sort of help each other out in answering them on the spot. But certainly, if we don't get to something while we're talking, we'll try our best to do it at the end. Um, so, with that, would you like to take it away, Mr. Hawthorne? I, I will take it away. I would say uh, while you're talking about the name of our of our uh, reconception of the show. A very good idea when you are naming a piece of theater that is going to be presented online is not to use any HTML code <laughs> in the name because we broke multiple websites where like the name of the piece would just disappear because of course like you know it looks like a bracket of, of HTML code and so every text editor was like what well, not going to show that and we're like no you oh god so first first thing you do is you don't use HTML code uh, when creating a piece of theater. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of trajectory of the company, specifically starting from the point of hair in 2006, where Ada and I joined the company. Um, the company back then was sort of a more of a traditional, what we would call um, a contractor model, right? So I was uh, the co-sound designer along with a guy named Travis Sawyer of hair um, and continued to be hired as a sound designer for the company uh, for, for uh, many years afterwards. Um, and a lot of the works at the same time were uh, what I would call a more sort of traditional text-based uh, pieces of theater. So we did, Ada and I worked on Death of a Salesman together. Uh, were you on Medea? No, okay. So Death of a Salesman, Hair, um, Medea, these are sort of uh, text to sort of understood known quantities we were then presenting and sort of putting our twist on. Um, and the, 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 the productions were always I would say extraordinarily um, experimental, but they were falling within a sort of an understood theatrical form. Um, and then starting in around uh, sort of 2013 with a piece called uh, Juarez, a documentary mythology, uh, we started to experiment with a different, a, a new form to us, um, which we called autonomous installations, um, which people from the art realm would sort of know as an installation art practice. And uh, it was a piece uh, around our founding artistic director, Ruben Palendo's life growing up on the Ciudad Juarez, El Paso border, uh, existing in this sort of liminal space, not fully American, not fully Mexican, but sort of wholly part of this, this uh, individualized neighborhood of these twin cities crossing the border daily to go to school um, and, and what that experience was for him and how Juarez has changed and, you know, Juarez was the murder, murder capital of the world for a long time, and right across the Rio Grande was the safest city in America, and sort of what that dichotomy meant uh, for the people that existed between these two spaces. Um, and so we did, uh, went to Juarez a number of times, for, did a, a large amount of research, a lot of uh, sort of first-person interviews with the people that lived in El Paso, his family, um, and we uh, began to this sort of laboratory practice of uh, getting into a room together and uh, just really thinking about the research that we were doing and starting to imagine how we might present this information. And the practice was really about um, each person taking on what you might call like a lead artist role and having authorship over the text, the sound design, the sort of staging, if you will, um, the number of performers, their interactions, um, and sort of creating an entire little theater diorama piece that could be 30 seconds long, it could be 10 minutes long. Um, and the laboratory sort of looks very alien, I think to anybody else, you walk into a room and it's just a bunch of people like on headphones in front of laptops, like typing away or like somebody grabs, you know, a floodlight, like points it against a wall and sort of like starts doing like, I don't know, like characters against the wall, sort of, you know, very strange space. Um, but eventually somebody might be like, oh, I've got something to show and we'll all pause our work, gather around. And then somebody will sort of present a little bit of installation art, a little, a little piece. Um, and then it's one of the things that I love so much about Theater Me Too is that it's an incredibly caring and loving group of people, but we're also an incredibly honest uh, group of people. And so once somebody has shown something, then it's a chance to really sort of stand around and talk about it, be like, okay, this really resonated with me. I loved what you did here. Or like, oh, I didn't really understand what you were doing there. What does that mean? Um, so it was, it was a, a really invigorating um, new methodology of creating work. And was, uh, for me at least, sort of beginning to incorporate my interest in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity into my actual professional work um, in a way that was not about like, well, you're the sound designer, so you, here's your text and you are going to sound design this show. It was really like, well, how do we as a group of artists, a permanent company, a permanent ensemble, how do we want to present this work? Um, and it was just, it was wonderful. And we've been iterating on that sort of form ever since. 
Um, so after Juarez, we did a show called Hamlet Ur Hamlet uh, in Abu Dhabi at NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, and then came Remnant, uh, and then was House uh, in 2019. Uh, and we're we're working on a new piece now, which we'll maybe sort of talk about at the very uh, at the very end. Plug plug that uh, at the end. Uh, so Remnant did start off many 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 years ago as a, a Wojtek project, actually sort of originally, I believe, sort of brought up by by one Miss Ada Westfall. Um, True story. And, and then, you know, we we're like, okay, so we started doing interviews with, uh, we the company was still in residence at New York, uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. And so we were doing uh, sort of research trips to Beirut and to Africa and sort of areas around there uh, and interviewing soldiers. And the piece started to expand uh, beyond just soldiers. It was sort of about like this meditation on death and sort of approaching death and returning from that from that moment. Uh, and the title sort of both is about what is what you bring back with you and also what is left behind uh, in those in those interactions. Um, various other uh, sort of bifurcations of the research started to occur. So we started talking to end of life nurse practitioners and doctors and philosophers and scientists uh, and just sort of trying to get a sort of, a, I don't know, maybe like a holistic viewpoint on, on death. Um, but there was also this sort of heavy element of PTSD and the sort of trauma that is involved in returning from, a, from a, an interaction with death, whether it be somebody else's death, a near death experience of your own um, and sort of what older texts have to say about this kind of stuff. And so that's sort of where the project started to, to grow from. Um, we probably developed it over the course of about three years. That's usually the sort of life cycle of our work. Um, and so we were able to premiere it here in Me Too 580, where I'm currently sat, uh, in uh, the fall the fall of 2018. Uh, we were able to tour it a little bit. Uh, in 2019, we were able to take it to the Mess Festival in Sarajevo uh, in October of 2019, and then had a couple of ideas about where we might be able to tour it in 2020, but 2020 had different ideas uh, about that. And so we had an opportunity to rethink our work, which is obviously something that we're rather comfortable in doing, sort of very happy living in these liminal spaces where we're not, uh, maybe not masters of our craft, but we're bringing our own mastery and our own particular uh, specialties into, into the work that we're doing. And we got a chance to sort of reinvent this piece uh, with the idea that it would be a digital only uh, experience. And Remnant remains the piece of theater uh, that I am most proud of in the entirety of my um, artistic career. And so I was very happy and very excited to, to have another uh, chance to revisit it in, in this new um, situation. And of course, it sort of, we talked about whether it would be a, an audio, like an audio only, project or an audio forward project. Um, we didn't want to like just create like a really long music video. And so what did that sort of, what was this going to be? Um, and so, so that sort of catches us up until now. Um, I've got my little notes here. Um, in performance, uh, just to sort of add on to the, the complexities, we didn't really have a stage manager or anybody running the show. Um, the lighting and the projections computers were all tied back to the sound computer. And we were running a program called QLab and I had like a 2000 Q, Q list that would just run all three boxes, all of these three uh, boxes simultaneously. And so the audience would walk in, uh, Ada and I would be actually like jamming out uh, from our sort of individual spaces across the theater. Um, and the audience would be invited to sit down in front of any one of three banks of seating in front of these sort of identical structures and they'd put headphones on um, and the show would start. The lights would come up in front of them and there would be these performers in, uh, in a sort of cube of scrim and projection material in front of them. Um, the arc lasted about 20 minutes as those of you who have been able to watch the archival video sort of are aware of. Um, and at the end of the 20 minutes, like the lights would come back up and people would be asked to get up and then move to a different bank of seating, sit down, put on headphones again. And so over the course of a single performance, the audience would see all of the content though in three different potential orders. Um, and on the performer side of things, it got a little crazy because we were doing the same exact thing three times in a row. Uh, six times on the two show days, which uh, for me, having not much of a performance background in terms of like doing the same thing over and over again, it got a little like, um, I think what you imagine working at like a theme park, you're like, we're doing it again, which is this number five or number six? Um, 
I've had plenty exercise. of performance experience and it was just as crazy. Nothing, nothing like doing the same 20 minute cycle three times in a row. And then again, oh my God. In, all in one day. Yeah. Crazy. It was just, just, just crazy making. And by the end of the run, I was like, maybe I don't want to perform with this company. Maybe I should just stick to the making and, and not the doing. Um, but anyway, so, so that was the sort of background on the show. Um, and so when we were thinking about how to recontextualize it for the uh, digital experience, we did want to sort of maintain some level of, um, I mean, interactivity very lightly, but in terms of like, um, and not really a choose your own adventure, but just giving the audience some agency of like, oh, I'm going to start here not really knowing what you're about to experience, but then sort of being handed this experience and then being able to sort of choose part two. And then obviously part three would be whatever was left. Um, and so that got baked into the functionality of the website. We worked very closely with um, Alex Reeves at Moonpool uh, to develop the website, um, which is this is what one minute feels like dot com. Um, and to sort of really try and design this customized experience for the website of like there's sort of a, a entrance page there's a pre-show experience, then there's the performance itself. Um, and we had long conversations about, you know, what is important in digital theater, what isn't important in digital theater. I felt very strongly that it should be a scheduled, like this starts at this time, um, as opposed to a like, oh, access at any time, the website's open for a week when you buy your ticket. Um, this idea of sort of trying to create a sense of community around a group of people that are seeing a show um, together uh, we did talk about whether we wanted like avatars floating around of like these other people are watching the show with you. Um, that felt less potent to us, but just the idea of like, this is something special. You show up at this time, the show begins. Um, sort of felt felt uh, like a, maybe like a defining characteristic between theater and a piece of digital art or installation art. Um, so, so yeah, so that's sort of an overview of, of the show and how it's created. Um, I've pulled up a couple of videos from from both from the um, archival video of 2018, the digitally in 2020, um, and also um, some of the. I went back into the archives and found some some of our original creation videos. Um, so uh, I'll start with the what we call box A, which starts off with uh, Michael Liddick, who sort of is pulling on this uh, one piece uh, coverall suit, and he's he's keeps having these sort of like feedback moments. Um, and it was a piece that I had conceived of uh, by putting a microphone, a small microphone in the palm of my hand and trying to do sort of basic tasks. Um, and I am going to share a screen and I'm going to remember to share the audio uh, and we'll watch maybe about a minute of this. So this would have been just to, to clarify part of our autonomous installation uh step in the process so still during the development of the show um and correct i think this was probably 2016 or 2017. Sounds i can't remember right. when we were there but yeah I think, I think 17. sure um so this would have been me i would have worked on this for a little bit and then said like okay i've got something to show and then uh ruben uh polendo would start filming and and i would title it it's titled story time uh and then i would i would perform it there we go it's marker great uh, this is switch. Sorry. Uh, this is called uh, story time. Okay. Whenever you're ready.
just gonna skip ahead a little bit. If you look closely, you can actually see the wire mm -hmm. going up Alex's arm that's connected to the microphone that's in the palm of his hand holding the bottle of water. Pretty soon, I think it starts feeding back. <laughs> and so that was... Uh, the, the, the feedback wasn't intentional. It's just sort of a factor of like having this small microphone that was extremely amplified cupped in my hand. And as I was trying to grab things, it would feed back on me. Um, so unintentional, but it would actually turn out to be that was something that we were very interested in. And so we started experimenting with um, what the feedback could be used for, like whether it felt like, you know, reactions to everyday activities that weren't working out, sort of like uh, this idea of PTSD, of trying to interact with the natural world uh, and feeling like there was there was negative response uh, that you were receiving. Um, and so what that eventually morphed into was uh, Mikey at the top of uh, box A and uh, his, his piece. So here it is from the uh, 2020 production. To wit so you can see a lot of like similar iconography in there with like the book, the lamp was already in place. Um, the, the existence of a, of a small piece of fruit sitting dead center was actually in my installation, the original video is left over from, I think a previous Mikey installation. And so sort of these ideas of iconography are starting to cross and take form. Um, and, you know, are sort of, you can witness them now and, and they're sort of more final final form as it were um from from small little baby thing growing up into the full production um and to me this is this is an interesting example of one of the things that you sort of mentioned in the description of the uh, of this master class is the idea of disembodied performance um which i think really takes on saliency when you're talking about uh making non in non in person theater um although something that we had talked about as early as as juarez um which is just about I mean, I think it can take a number of different forms, like disembodied performance uh, could be, you know, a, a body on stage, but the voice is pre-recorded and, and language coming from somebody, uh, somebody else or like through headphones. Um, but in this case, to me, I take it to mean that like, this is a person that you don't know, you're not aware of, of their backstory. Um, and even their interaction with space is seemingly sort of like othering and different. But the ultimate sort of like information carrying device is the audio. And it's actually not audio that this person is creating, right? It's this feedback effect. And so uh, you're learning the most about this sort of like loosely quote unquote character, um, not through their own speech or actions, but sort of through the interactions with the, like the actions that the outside world are applying upon them. Um, and disembodied performance sort of really covers a gamut of different things. Um, we, for much of the 2020 uh, version of the show, tried to remove a lot of our own bodies from it. And uh, Mikey is actually one of the sort of the few people that appear over the course of the of the piece. We were much more interested in sort of finding different ways to 
to create and uh, transmit an idea of character or or a through line for you to for you to follow via other means. Um, and so a lot of the work that I did was about um, through the sound trying to give uh, a sense of place and of uh, you know emotion and time, time of day, time period, um, and then also of like. You know, I, I think back to the beginning of um, what we would call Box C, which is the uh, the doctor and the spelling of words and a piece that we on our sort of end of things called Blink um, and how we can transmit a sense of uh, hospitalization and sort of like a lack of orientation, like a disorienting kind of feeling um, through through the sound. Um, and so that was a piece that Justin Nestor, the co-artistic director, originally uh, brought to the table and sort of presented uh, fairly similarly, actually, to the way that you see it in the 2018 version, uh, which I believe I have a video of. Um, and, uh, and then when we had a chance to sort of move towards the digital version, uh, and we sort of talked about like maybe trying not to we didn't want to make this simply like a film of, of the stage production. Um, and so we did a lot of work in terms of like, got everybody to re-record their language. I mean, a lot of the language in the original piece was pre-recorded uh, anyway, um, but then it was about any of the live dialogue then being um, recorded. And so, you know, when everybody and their mother was uh, buying USB <laughs> microphones at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. We were also like trying to find enough recording gear to go around to send to everybody um, so that everybody could record their language. Um, and there was a variety, I would say a variety of different um, levels of recording. I mean, we were able to get a few people USB mics. Um, some people sort of already had podcast-esque or uh, voiceover-esque setups in their apartments. And so they just sort of did their thing and sent me files. Um, one person who shall remain nameless, uh, like who was like, I have my iPhone or my AirPods. And I was like, okay, sure. Let's see, let's see what it sounds like. And so they crawled into bed and like threw a blanket over their heads, uh, and sent me an AB between the AirPods and the iPhone. And I thought for sure I was going to prefer the iPhone, but actually the AirPods sounded, uh, sounded okay. We went with the AirPods. Really? Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Shocking. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and once again, you know, this piece survives um, in that way of like a variety of different recording situations and scenarios. Um, I think it survives really based on the fact that we were often trying to then go back and dirty up or gritty up or texturize the recording. So there's zero audio in here that has not been processed, at least a little bit with EQ and compression. But a lot of times I was... Um, using some panning tricks, some distortion, some uh, just different treatments, different types of reverb to try and differentiate uh, a single, you know, like Ada's voice might appear in three or four different sort of quote unquote characters. And I want to be able to differentiate between them all across the, the hour long experience. <coughs> um, and actually Justin, uh, Justin's Blink piece is a good example um, because he later comes back, uh, you know, within 10 minutes or so, comes back as Stephen Hawking, uh, speaking some text from Stephen Hawking. And I wanted to make sure that there was zero chance that you thought that perhaps this person was also the doctor from the beginning of the piece. Um, so I will we'll watch the Blink piece from 2018 and then watch the Blink piece from 2020. And we'll go from there. I want you to know that this is perhaps the most important job I've ever been given, and I'm determined to succeed. Hey, Alex, yes, will you clarify for a sec the what the boxes are in the point. corners of this video? Oh, sure, that's a good. So we know good what we're call. looking at. Yeah. So I mean, I've been using these titles A, B, and C for our boxes, and you can see the big C right here notes that we're in box C, and so the small boxes are sort of picture in picture. Uh, of what's going on simultaneously in the other boxes. Um, there is occasionally both intentionally and also sort of by lucky happenstance, uh, some ability that the boxes have to cross talk to each other. Um, and so when, which was hard for us to sort of plan, it was hard for us to plan out and really hard for us to sort of see the lucky, um, the lucky happenings as we put the piece together. Um, 
because we were all inside these boxes and it was very hard to sort of take a step back and watch the whole thing. But looking at the video, you start to realize the way these different moments talk to each other. Um, and I also started to notice it as I was working. Uh, I'll show, I'm gonna share a logic file with, uh, with the full uh, 2020 version in, in, a, in a moment. Um, but you start to really see the relationship between these three pieces over the course of time, like where events are happening across all three boxes at the same time. Um, and so in these videos, uh, A and B are the other two boxes that also have performers in them activated at the same time. Um, so the audio you're hearing and the main video, the sort of central video is all from box C, but you're able to see boxes A and B at the same time to sort of track what's happening and get a sense of this idea that all three things are happening at the same time. Which of course, if you'd been sitting there for real, had you come to see the show at Me Too 580 in 2018, you would have been able to just turn your head and see box A sitting over there with another bank of audience watching it, but not hear it. You can, you'd only be able to hear the box you're looking at. So this is as though you're sitting watching box C. And, with your headphones on. And, yeah, yeah, and you're sort of peripherally aware of box A and box mm -hmm. B. This was our, our little like demo video way of representing that and i think i mean i'm fairly certain this box this this particular video was originally created both for sort of our own archival but then also to try and explain to presenters like what this piece was you like you know so often you'll send a video of the piece to a presenter and be like please host us we'd like to tour to your town city country um and and this video is how the way we created uh, a video to give a sense of of how the piece operates uh in physical space um Oh, I had one other thing and I and I lost. Oh, yes. Um, if you are not, if you have the ability to wear headphones and you are not currently wearing headphones, uh, I would highly recommend it as we're about to get into some sort of like talks about pan and placement. Um, and it'll be, uh, you know, a much better viewing experience and, and listening experience uh, on on headphones. Uh, so yeah, so I will show a uh, link from 2018. I want you to know that this is perhaps the most important job I've ever been given, and I'm determined to succeed, with your help, of course. We're going to start by finding out how much you understand. I'll ask questions, and you answer. But remember, you answer by blinking once for yes or twice for no. You ready? Good. Is the sun too bright for you? Am I a man? Am I a woman? Is it midnight right now? Are we in Paris? Another thing that's worth talking about when we look at this video, uh, you can see Justin reaches for his pocket right at the top, right there. Um, so for the performance, we were all wearing in-ear monitors. And one of the only ways that uh, we were able to sort of tie this whole thing together technically was if everybody was on very specific audio tracks to keep them exactly in line. Uh, with the rest of the queuing, because you know, I would hit spacebar at the top of uh, of a sort of of a cycle, um, and all of the queues would just run for the next twenty minutes. Um, and you know, every blink is a projection queue and a lighting queue, um, and the audio that you're hearing is obviously queued. And so everybody has to maintain very very tight onto their onto their marks, and the microphones turn on and off. And if you get behind. The mic just turns off. It doesn't care about you. It just keeps moving. It was a fairly it was it was very much a roller coaster ride of a of a theatrical experience because um, there was no once once that train left the station there was no stopping it. Um, and so what Justin is listening to is actually a pre recorded um, track of his own language. And so he is speaking the words. They are coming into his ear and going out of his mouth, um, which is. Uh, a very disconcerting experience where you're just trying to like hear text and speak it immediately. Um, but we've been doing this since 2013 with Juarez. And so uh, most of the company members are, are fairly facile with this particular uh, practice. Um, and so in this video, you can hear that there's like a bit of like a sort of hospitally soundscape and sort of panned a little bit left and right. Um, you know, you hear sort of the um, respirator and the heart uh, monitor and sort of some like hallway chattery noise um, and uh, and then Justin's voice on the microphone. Um, and partially due to complexities and sort of at this point we were still running all of the microphones uh, through QLab, although probably now we would have utilized Mainstage or uh, possibly Ableton, a different program to handle microphones. Um, it was 
easiest to sort of turn the mics on, give them a bit of effect and then turn them off, maybe sort of adjusting level, but weren't so much doing stuff with like pan or increases, decreases in reverb and effects uh, mixing. Um, but starting with the 2020 production, I had a I had just had more time, you know, it wasn't a sort of a week long tech process. Um, I had these tracks, I could sort of sit with them for a while and think about the best way to, to sort of help communicate this. Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing that and share a new video. So then in 2020, Blink starts to look like this. I want you to know that this is perhaps the most important job I've ever been given, and I'm determined to succeed. With your help, of course. We're going to start by finding out how much you understand. I'll ask questions, and you answer. But remember, you answer by blinking once for yes, or twice for no. You ready? Good. And so what I was trying to create in that moment was a sense of like the sort of confusion you have coming out of like a chemical chemically induced sleep and so his voice starts really reverby it starts way off to the side my sort of thought is you're lying in a hospital bed and there's this voice talking at you and as you sort of wake up and your brain starts to sort of come back into operational mode you would turn your head to look at the doctor and at that moment his voice starts to pan sort of more center towards you as if you're looking at this person um and so it was tricks like this that I was able to uh, try and sort of very subtly start to influence this idea of both like place and time um, and at least give you uh, a few extra oral hints as to where you might be, what's going on. Um, so I'm, I'm going to play that again because it's 29 seconds um, and just sort of listen for the for the pan information of the voice. I want you to know that this is perhaps the most important job I've ever been given, and I'm determined to succeed. With your help, of course. We're going to start by finding out how much you understand. I'll ask questions, and you answer. But remember, you answer by blinking once for yes, or twice for no. You ready? Good. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, hopefully that, that was, that was clear to everybody. Um, I'm going to open up the logic section session now, uh, and this is a direct copy of, of what I worked with to create the, the thing. You can see it comes in at just a shade under 96 tracks of audio for the whole thing. Um, and so I just have these three groups, box A, B, and C, and it allows me to make sure that they're all exactly the same length down to the sample they are all exactly the same length of time uh, and so if i open up box a uh nah, that's the wrong box let's go ahead and close that uh let's go ahead and open up box c uh so you can see i've got jan's uh voice over here um and then i've got this a couple of different um uh tracks of of audio that i pulled straight from the the q lab file my original attempt was uh i hit play on QLab into a program called Audio Hijack and just tried to record a stereo track of the, of the QLab file um, and realized very quickly that I'm far too type A to not have the ability to go in and just start to mess with every single sound file. Uh, so I went in and rebuilt the entire QLab file in, in Logic. Um, and so every, every single sound file that is in QLab is now represented in this logic file, along with a number of uh, additional files that I sort of added and augmented um, the piece with. Um, so to do sort of a, a, a brief deep dive, a quick deep dive, um, just looking at the automation for something like Justin's voiceover, um, number of different uh, things going on here, if I remember correctly different reverbs, um, some high shelf uh, EQ changes. And uh, yeah, I was working, I was, I, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, are you able to see this plugin window if I bring it up in front? Good. Um, so this is a free Sennheiser plugin called Ambio, which is within their sort of VR 3D spatialization. Um, it, it doesn't work better or worse than a panning function. Um, it just sort of works differently. Um, 
for some people, I felt like it had a negative EQ effect on their voice. And so I didn't use it. Um, and other people sort of, it felt okay. Um, and so if I were to play this from here, I want you to know that this is perhaps the most important job I've ever been given, and I'm determined to succeed. With your help, of course. We're going to start by finding out how much you understand. I'll ask questions, and you answer. But remember, you answer by blinking once for yes, or twice for no. You ready? Good. So you can see that it both starts very wide, and at like 20 close to 30 degrees off to the, yeah, 30 degrees off to the right. And then slowly both sort of compresses in terms of focus and then pans towards the center. Um, one of the things that I felt very strongly about was not going too crazy with panning tricks because um, I didn't want the audience member to feel like things were just sort of flying around their heads. Um, but even a fairly subtle, I mean, you know, it looks fairly subtle in the, in the automation going from 30 degrees to eight degrees feels actually like a fairly significant move, um, at least in terms of, I would say, in terms of realism. Um, there were a couple places where I got a little more um, uh, adventurous with the panning, um, but uh, which, which if we have some time, maybe we'll visit. Um, but the other thing that I wanna compare is Justin's delivery as the doctor, and then flipping forward to Justin as Hawking. Um, so here I've got, um, so this is looking at the, Blink Doctor. Um, there is a neutron equalizer, a spectral denoiser, just to clean up some of the recording, uh, and then that Ambio Orbit um, plug-in. Uh, and then this is going to a, a, a study reader, sort of a small room. Um, but then if I click on Hawking here for his voiceover, um, similar things, I've got an EQ, spectral denoiser, and then I've got a, a waves um, a compressor going there, and then sort of one plugin that I, I used fairly frequently on this called um, uh, Saturator. So it sort of adds some um, harmonic distortion. Um, and Whiskey Vocal seems to be the perfect. Say, that's yeah. the preset is called Whiskey Vocal. I probably, that's amazing. I, I, think I, I think I tweaked it a little bit. But um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's one of, I will say, this is actually one of my favorite sounding voiceovers in the entire show. Uh, so uh, so let's, let's, let's take a listen to it. If one goes back in time, one comes to the Big Bang singularity, where the laws of physics break down. But there is another direction of time that one can go in which avoids the singularity. This is called the imaginary direction of time. In imaginary time, there need not be any singularities which form a beginning or an end to time. Uh, so yeah, so it's just a little bit of harmonic distortion. It gives him that sort of like, I mean, whiskey vocal seems to be a fairly accurate. It's got that sort of like raspy, gritty, high end kind of thing. Um, and it just, it works really well for his voice. And it, you know, I know for, uh, well, everybody's biased against the sound of their own voice, but like whiskey vocal doesn't do much for my own, my own voice when I'm, when I'm doing voiceover work. Um, so, you know, just it's about regular sort of, old whiskey. Just, <laughs> just got <laughs> oh, the plugin is probably cheaper than a bottle of whiskey. Um, <laughs> But I won't say any more about that. Um, yeah, so uh, really helpful to like find a preset, um, and then you just start to sort of tweak and finding different ways to define a voice as a character. Um, one performer doing multiple different voices or characters, finding that different way to differentiate those people, I think is is very important um, and useful. Um, and sort of in the exact on the exact flip side, one of the things I also really wanted to do was um, subconsciously. Um, bring back certain sounds that you would um, begin to, you know, subconsciously recognize or you would hear over and over again. Um, there's a piece here. Let's see, Kodiak is in box A. Um, so there's a series of interviews that we recorded using um, uh, uh, binaural earbuds. Um, so these are, they sort of look like regular um, iPhone earbuds, um, but they have microphones in the earbuds themselves. So there are microphones sticking out and earbuds, stick, you know, speakers sticking in. Um, and it allows, uh, it, it, it's fairly personalized per person, but essentially a recording, a stereo recording using these earbuds is supposed to mimic the idea of sound coming directly in, uh, into your, to your, uh, your ears. And so 
Um, it spatializes things in a really specific uh, way as opposed to sort of, you know, a normal like X, Y axis stereo mic recording. Um, and so we made these recordings in the theater itself. Um, and uh, sort of, I just put all of the different performers in different places. Um, they, uh, Nia, they are called, uh, oh, you put me on the spot. Roland, I want to say C... M10E, if you search Roland binaural earbuds, I think they're about $100 um, and they're great. They have two little eighth inch jacks. Um, I use a Zoom H6 handheld recorder. And so I just plug one into the headphone out and then one into the uh, sort of mic, the stereo mic input on the XY uh, module actually. Well, I have my Zoom here. fish it out so zoom regular zoom and it's got a little tiny eighth inch jack right there that's a stereo mic input and so you can plug them into this this fine fine thing right there um so i just arranged all the actors in space uh, all the performers in space and recorded each one of their um sections of dialogue and sort of tried to either keep my head in a certain position in relationship to them. So I'd sort of keep them here and not even look at them and record off here. Um, or I'd like slowly turn my head and get a sense of pan. And then I went in and, and mixed it all into this, what we call Kodiak and Co. Um, and underneath it, when we were in performance in 2018, uh, Ruben Palendo and I were sort of looking at it. We're like, it's nice. It just needs a, a little, little something underneath it, a little something to support it and just sort of heighten it a little bit. Um, and so I very quickly made these two uh, air drone and beat drone, which I will, uh, I will solo as we go through. I'm gonna hand it off to Ada shortly, but we'll try and try and get in a little bit further. So uh, this is the 2020 version of Kodiak and Co. What are you most proud of? And what did people ask about your time in the military? Uh, I got clean and sober 25 years ago and everything was fine. Until I was looking for my military records a couple of years ago. And so you can sort of feel it's a little bit off to your right. Memories came be. back. Fucking mad at everybody. The only thing, only time I was controllable was when I was stoned. I did a psyche vow and said, oh, man, he's got some anger issues, but it's nothing that can't be solved with maturity. I mean, these really? days I never think. You want to see anything. anger? I never think that much of myself, you know, compared to back then. You know, it was just. A lot of shit. people like, are excited about the shooting. Why? The sound itself isn't enough. So underneath is this is this mixture of, of an air drone and a beat drone down just a bit. Um, just a nice texture to sort of keep keep the audience sort of keep your attention there, heighten it a little bit. Um, and then the beat drone underneath. Just subtly moves across the uh, across the space. Um, and I might be biased because of course I made these, but I quite enjoy them. And so they, uh, they got snuck in a few different places. Um, so we are in, uh, box a here. Um, and actually what's so strange is I can sort of keep my cursor in the exact same space and scroll down and, uh, they end up also showing up in um, in box B as well during this section of the uh, Mahabharata. Um, and then they show up in uh, C as well, although I'm less, yep, there it is again, um, under, under Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, and so I, I enjoyed this as sort of a chance to look into the audio and sort of think about being able to make connections across the across the different boxes and across the different spaces, um, and uh, and there were a couple other um, sounds that came in a number of times. There was a um, it's actually a really long callback to a previous show. This single low fam um, under this fluorescent loop. So this is a recording of uh, Mikey. Um, an interview with a, a an interview that we called Ren. Um, Marine Corps frontline assault. My military occupational specialty was zero three five one. Uh oh, this is my husband. Um, he want to sit on the interview if that's okay. Uh, we never really talked about this stuff, and uh, he wanted to hear. So, uh, I hope that's okay. So, what you've got underneath is this 
loop of a fluorescent uh, tube, which is a, a sound that I, 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 I wouldn't say like I enjoy hearing it, but I really do love using it. I think it holds texture in a really good way. Um, and then also just every so often throwing um, this single low fan blade in. Um, and the idea is that it's like one of those just sort of like in giant, you know, 20 foot industrial fan blades sort of going by. It's a very cinematic idea. It's not based in realism, um, but there's just something like low and um, somehow like austerely emotional or like industrially emotional to it that I really like and that I think it holds space really well um, without getting in the way of the dialogue. And so it just sort of sits there very low throughout the sequence and also um, appears a couple of different times. Um, so that's, you know, sort of a very, a very quick dive into uh, a number of the different sort of approaches that I took uh, to, to, to try and create the artistic intent uh, as purely the same as what we had in 2018, while also um, allowing ourselves to sort of even further investigate this, this project. Um, it feels so often like, the, you know, if you're doing a remount or you're putting a show out on tour, that it's about like taking the original intent and then sort of trying to repackage it into something that is sort of close enough. Whereas I really feel like with this project, what we were able to do was take um, a piece that we all loved very deeply and we're very proud of and then like really let it grow into like a version 2.0 um, and in a way sort of morph and meld into something newer and greater than than i think we maybe could have uh, imagined in my opinion uh when we were when we were first creating it um the the best part about being the first one to talk here is that i uh i absolutely will not be playing you any solo tracks of me singing even though that does happen um and let me tell you, the Waves uh, tune plugin uh, plastered all over my vocals for did this. Did you uh, auto tune yourself? Absolutely, oh, I absolutely Alex, your did. Your voice is beautiful just as it is, but I appreciate that. Well, <laughs> I I had to. I am a vain person, and I auto tune myself. Um, so anyway, but there is obviously, if you've seen uh, the 2018 uh, video or the 2020 video, I hope you. Uh, all had a chance to watch them before we started. Um, although those links will remain active for about a, a week afterwards. So if you want to sort of either revisit them um, after watching this masterclass or you didn't have a chance to watch them prior to, totally fine. Um, but the music is such a huge part of this piece and uh, and Ada and Caleb, uh, Caleb who's another company member um, who wrote a, a song in box B and Ada wrote music for, for all three boxes like the poly math that she is. Um, the music is something really, really special. Uh, and so I am so happy uh, to be able to hand over the mic baton to my dear, lovely Ada Westfall, uh, who's gonna talk some, some more stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Take it away. Uh, thank you for all of that. That, that was really fun to, uh, to uh, I, you know, it's funny, I've heard so much of that sound countless times um and 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 yet like to 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 watch you break it down and to hear like the individual elements and to hear those tracks soloed and to see how you you know it's it's funny to like obviously encounter your work so much and so intimately and yet realize in a moment like how uh how little i know about the the nuts and bolts of the choices you're making so that, that's that's very um exciting well, and, and one of the things that we talked about in this process was about how strange it was to try and work on a collaborative art form. I was in LA in my studio, you were at home in your studio. And, you know, one of the things that's great about Theater Me Too is, you know, the pieces are called a Theater Me Too collaboration. Um, we are so often in a room creating, even if we're sort of creating in our little like weird silos, we're still sitting with people and being like, hey, read this text. Does this resonate with you? Or like, yeah. oh, look at this cool video I found. And so that was something that was certainly lacking um in this creation process of of the of the revamped remnant but yeah anyway please yeah. take it away agreed uh well i think i think something that you uh that you were just talking about uh, that actually actually functions as a really lovely segue uh into uh what i'm going to focus on here uh uh has to do sort of ho holistically a, a, about about this process um a, as alex was uh describing um we basically spent three years developing this show and what we ended up presenting was of you know uh, 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 from I, I would say an, an almost indispensably like cor corporal corporeal uh, experience um in that you would show up in the space 
uh, you were physically putting on headphones. You're watching. Uh, oh, God, I just hit my funny bone on that chair. My arm is on fire. OK, going to talk through it. Um, uh, wow, that is the worst pain in history. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, uh, speaking of corporeal, you can hit your funny bone and it really hurts. Um, but basically, you're sitting there, you're putting on headphones, you're you're physically able to see these three spaces in which there's these 20 minute shows happening. Um, and, uh, and, and most importantly, you're watching us the performers uh, as uh, be vessels for this sort of information that's happening on stage. I, I don't know how many folks here were, were in fact, either saw the piece originally, or, you know, either iteration of it, or were able to watch the stuff ahead of time. If not, I hope you get a chance to watch after this, so you'll understand what we're talking about a little more. Um, but uh, the uh, your the show itself, I would say, there's you know, it's it's not a narrative experience per se. There's it's not there's not really characters. There's certainly not a story. It's more that we're we're meditating on an idea or a set of ideas and and sitting in vibes and placing images in juxtaposition with one another and um and what ends up happening for us as performers in uh the stage version is that we our bodies very much become vessels for this sort of information and these ideas so the text you're literally watching us speak text you're watching us um engage in phrases of movement um uh, I'll, I'll be more show musical theater and, <laughs> and call it choreography. You're watching us, you know, uh, under, undergo choreographed actions. Um, and our, and our bodies in space are really important to what we're, uh, what we're telling, uh, and what we're, uh, what we're, you know, the sort of the ideas that we're trying to impart to you. Um, so, uh, what happened was, uh, we had been planning uh, to tour this show. In fact, we had toured this show. We'd taken it to a festival in Sarajevo after we did it originally in 2018 at uh, at our space, Me Too 580 in Gowanus. Um, and uh, we were set to tour it some more. And then, of course, the event uh, happened that is still happening that changed everybody's lives, which is that COVID struck. Um, and uh, And so suddenly... Uh, physically touring the show was no longer a possibility. And I'm sure, you know, everybody watching has heard this story told countless times by countless theater companies because we all had things we were trying to do in the past year, year and a half uh, that we couldn't. So um, thankfully, uh, the 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 opportunity was offered to us to uh, to take our, our, our stage show and put it in this digital format. And so... Um, the question obviously became, how are we going to do that? Uh, and the first thing that we very much agreed on, and I think um, Alex mentioned this already, is that what we definitely didn't want to do, I mean, first of all, what we, what we, what we didn't have the capability to do for logistical reasons uh, and because of the nature of this show was try to mount a version of it where we had uh, uh, actual, like, like trying to live stream you know, performers performing in the moment, which, you know, since then I've seen, I've actually seen a number of pieces, including some that have actually been at uh, Me Too 580, uh, uh, that have, you know, have the technology, have the means, have the space um, to, to accomplish that goal. But in this case, we said, we don't really know how we're going to engage performers actually live in such a way that doesn't cause us to have to completely compromise uh, the thing that we've built. Um, so we we settled on a model that instead um, uh, was ba was effectively like uh, pre recorded video. But I have to say, even me saying it that way uh, uh, it makes it sound wrong. In that in that that's exactly what we were not interested in doing. What we did not want the experience of the digital version of this show to be was you watching video of the show you would have been seeing because a video of theater, I mean, I'm sure, you know, I mean, obviously if you have like 
huge production values and you're Disney, you can shoot Hamilton and it looks gorgeous and whatever. But, you know, generally speaking, videos of theater don't really do it justice. It just feels like an inherently compromised version of the thing uh, that you would be doing. And, and, and that's exactly what we didn't want. We didn't want you to sit here and go, oh man, it, it seemed cool. Wish I could have seen it in person, right? Um, so we said that this piece um, instead should be taking its cues from uh, video art and from installation art. In fact, almost hearkening all the way back to the beginning of our development process of, uh, of treating it as kind of like an uh, an, an installation, um, a, a, uh, so that you so that you are not encountering a compromised version of a piece of theater, but rather something that was designed and implemented specifically for this format. Um, so the question became: uh, None of us, I don't think a single one of us in our in our in our company uh identifies necessarily primarily as a video uh editor um because we're all theater artists um and even though within our uh process uh, uh in in the past few shows it's you know it's caught we've had to uh create video content oftentimes for screens that we physically have on stage and remnant is no exception um this was basically going to be effectively editing together an hour and a half long movie, like effectively a feature length film um, uh, and trying to bring, trying to convey the, the, uh, the sense of what we made, but for this format. So um, I was approached <laughs> by the company to sort of uh, undertake this because I, uh, well, I will say I'm, I'm, I'm by no means an expert in any way, shape or form at, uh, at video editing. I do have a fair amount of experience with Final Cut and I think, uh, Final Cut Pro. And I think the, the, the most important factor in that is that, uh, I, I think I think a thing that we do in the company is we like to take whatever practice is our main one and sort of uh, create an analog for ourselves into another practice. Um, so truthfully, as I stated, you know, way back at the beginning of this, I'm a songwriter. Uh, I'm a musician. So the challenge that was set forth to me uh, by uh, by the company and by our artistic directors was, Ada, can you use basically your your music brain? Um, and, and, uh, approach this, uh, that way in that fashion, sort of edit music as an art or sorry, edit video as an artist who doesn't normally work in video. And I said, I will give it, I will do my best. Um, so, um, what I'd love to, uh, to look at, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of pull out a particular chunk and I want to show you similar to what Alex was doing. I want to show you how it evolved through the processes and talk about some of the decisions that I made in, uh, as we translated it to its, its, its final form, uh, maybe not final form, but it's digital form. Um, it's video form. Um, so, uh, in, uh, box a, um, one of the things that uh, that we had built a piece around was, uh, uh, as Alex mentioned, we had been doing um, as research, we'd been interviewing soldiers all over the place. Um, and there was one soldier in particular who we interviewed, I'm not going to say his name, but a, a US soldier. Um, and we had this, uh, this incredible text and footage from him where he was describing um, his experience uh fighting overseas and 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 when we asked him uh uh if he'd be willing to talk about this he actually gave us a condition and the condition was uh yes i'm willing to talk about it but only if um my husband uh would be allowed to sit in the interview and uh and listen because he said that this was something that he had never sort of, you know, for various emotional reasons, never taken the time to really talk with his husband about, and while it wasn't, you know, an actively kept secret or anything per se, uh, this was, uh, you know, particularly touchy information to talk about. And he felt like this was an opportunity to sort of deliver it to us as a third party, you know, as, as, an, as an exterior source, um, while his husband could actually listen and sort of gain this new insight um, into his partner. Uh, which, uh, and so in, in the video, which I'll, I'll show us a little bit of it, uh, uh, in, uh, shortly, uh, we have this, this beautifully framed shot where, um, 
the soldier is talking to, to, to a company member who's interviewing him off camera. And his husband is just sitting there right behind him in the background, just stone silent, um, taking in the things that he has to say, really intense things for the first time. Um, and uh, so, so, the, so that sort of ballooned into kind of, I'd say each one of the boxes, A, B, and C, have sort of like an overarching theme that they're dealing with. So I think box A is really focused on, on uh, if, since the, if the whole piece is talking about death, A is talking about war and soldiers uh, in particular. And then box C, which was a box that I was in, uh, is is speaking about it more from like a metaphysical standpoint and time and space. And as it relates to like, uh, almost more like hospital imagery, like sitting in a hospital bed. Um, and uh and then b is sort of talking about it um more conceptually and pulling like pieces of uh of of culture like the mahabharata and 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 put uh kind of talking about it from this almost like highly conceptual place so um i'd say that a kind of the heartbeat of a grew out of this interview that we had with this soldier um and uh so in the interest of as we, as we built the piece in the interest of kind of dilating that uh that uh text um one of the tools we often use for that and obviously i use a lot because i'm a musician is to put something into song um and uh so we ended up actually while we were in abu dhabi i believe this was a, a workshop that actually dima who was in the chat saying hi uh was present for um we uh uh we we built a couple of different pieces that centered around uh music and sort of like like uh orbiting around uh this guy's text so uh I, i'm only going to show a little quick pieces of these just so you can see uh, uh kind of where we were coming from here um in one case i found a piece of of his much larger interview where he says something to the effect of um of uh, of that, the 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 first question that whenever he meets a civilian in the world, um, who is going to in, interrogate him in some regard about uh, his experience as a soldier, um, it, it, the first question that he's always asked is, um, "Have you ever killed anybody?" Which he is sort of saying, almost citing as as like um, as on the one hand, like of course somebody would want to know that who's never come in contact with these things, and on the other hand, like how intrusive and how ridiculous and how what a what a what an you know a crazy personal question to ask somebody who's been through these deeply traumatic things so um as an experiment while this was at this workshop in abu dhabi uh, nyu abu dhabi where we had a residency for a while um i took that piece of text and uh sort of started trying to turn it into this uh this this musicalized version of it and meanwhile, as an artist, the other thing I'm trying to do, because we're working in this in this mode of autonomous installation where we're trying to um, iterate an idea that's, you know, that's uh, sort of aural and oral all at the same time, but also we're trying to deal with um, iterating a, a lighting proposition for it and a staging proposition and some architecture for it all, all at once. Um, I, uh, for the first time ever, I think, uh, wanted to also do the experiment of seeing if I could build a track in Ableton and then get it to basically boss other programs uh, to 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 synchronize uh, along with it, which which, you know, not not to say that this piece had a direct lineage to this, but that's actually what we ended up doing in the larger piece in person is that everything it's, it's basically these systems that are all kind of um, interconnected. So um, so the original version of this song, this song ended up being called The First Question, uh, looks a little something like this. Oh, good, I'm already sharing sound. Um, and uh, where'd you go, Alex? Oh, I see you, you're over there. Um, uh, and so, oh, also worth also worth saying, this is pre-transition for me. So I'm do I'm letting you all have a little window into <laughs> me pre-transition. So just know that. <laughs> Um, what I, what I basically want to show you is I basically composed this song. Uh, you can hear it, right, Alex? Great. Um, so this is all the soldier's text that I'm singing.
And the experiment here really was, can I get this track to control those lights that are happening? And this is hard to see in the video, but um, there's also a projector mounted from the ceiling that's projecting down onto Kayla, our other company member who's lying on the floor. So that's basically it. There's no, no reason to watch the whole thing, but uh, but you can hear like, I'm, I've am i basically taken his text, I've turned it into this song. And most of this installation uh, would would fall by the wayside. Uh, the the thing with Kayla lying on the floor in the box uh, would be gone. Me f uh, physically playing, well, actually I did end up playing the, the guitar in this piece, but not for this song. Um, that would go away, but the song itself hung around, right? And then meanwhile, we were playing, we were uh, as we were playing with music, um, we uh we stumbled across actually a cover song that we had an interest in um so uh oh wait hang on i want to open this not in vlc but in quick time for a second um so we also stumbled across there's this lovely if you don't know it this uh this lovely uh, kate bush song called army dreamers and uh, in this same workshop uh, at NYU Abu Dhabi, we had uh, the lovely Michael McElroy was uh, was acting as a guest artist with us, and he arranged this very pretty uh, version of Army Dreamers, which is a song that I believe is originally in three four, and he actually turned it into four four, which was really nice. Um, and so this was the other piece. And again, you can notice that we have implications of architecture all over the space. Um, so we've intentionally mounted a light right above him. Um, the, the, those poles that are that are sort of situated around him are marking sort of an idea that I would say later would become uh, the box covered in scrim that we performed the show within. Um, so he he ended up singing this really really heartfelt version of this Army Dreamers song, um, and a different artist who worked with us for a while named Shao is playing the violin back there. So, so that's so basically those are the two like building blocks a, as they occurred from from the installation portion of of our development of this piece right back in the workshop period of we have this song that I wrote and we have this song that <laughs> that Kate Bush wrote um, and that Michael uh, McElroy um, arranged um, so as we then built the piece uh, for a live setting uh, those those two songs ended up getting um, interpolated with um, some vi a video element that I'm gonna show you in a second and, and some physicality. Um, so let me pull that up so we can talk about it. I'm gonna do it the right way this time. So here, this is from that same, so this is the 2018 uh, live stage production of Remnant. And so you can see that's what those boxes are about in the corners, just the other, the other boxes happening concurrently. And if you were watching box A, you would see this. That throws me right back in the... I see him. I guess the this is that same song I wrote. And so you'll notice there's other elements from other installations we've looked at. Um, the light from Alex's uh, sort of mic hand thing. Only, there's the, the right physical here. actor, Michael you're Littig himself, um, is here. Um, he's, the text that he's speaking is text from that soldier's interview. Um, this man off to the side that you can see in silhouette is our, another company member named Corey Sullivan. Um, who's the other actor in this box? About. I guess that like, this is what I have to do every day when I wake up. And you'll see that on the TV screen, I don't know when it comes back to a shot of this, but on the TV screen, you'll see this foot, this uh, footage of like hands rubbing together. And that was something that our other company member, Justin Nestor created for a completely different installation in the development process, but got sort of interpolated dream. in here with these elements. There they are. Um, And so this was a uh, you know a, a more developed later draft of the song that I wrote, and that's my voice you're hearing uh, singing in my best David Bowie. Um, 
questions. So you'll see that as this piece builds, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, suddenly, like, there's a big move of the TV screen. Um, there's a new, another section of the song that was written later. And now we have this, uh, this phrase of movement as Corey comes in. Um, that's actually kind of sampled from a different uh, Me Too piece um, where he's going to do this sort of long lean back it over a chair, insanity. right? Um, meanwhile, he's speaking the different names uh, that we had for PTSD before we called it PTSD. So he starts way back in the 1800s. They called it Soldier's Heart. Um, and it moves forward to... Um, uh, shell shock uh, later on, they circa like World War One. They called it war neurosis. War neurosis in 1914, right? Um, so he's just listing names for PTSD um, as he performs this physical shock. action. Um, and you'll notice that the song, you're hearing Kayla Asbell's voice now, and she's now singing um, my adaptation of Michael McElroy's adaptation of Kate Bush's song, Army Dreamers. 1975 stress response syndrome so you get the idea um this is one that i i want to just kind of show you uh real quick and then i'm going to show you the actual whole chunk at the end of my little spiel here uh from from what it turned into so so the creative um the creative challenge for me became that the thing that i was just doing the thing i was just showing you was exactly what we did not want to do we did not want to show you a video of the show um so instead, uh, my challenge became, how do I take all of those elements? You, you, you heard me listing all of those creative um, uh, offers that were being made, right? Whether it's a, a, uh, the image, of, the icon of a prop, whether it's a, 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 like a physical move that someone's doing, whether it's uh, content that showed up on a video screen, right? Um, the question for me became, how do I take all of those elements and ditch the things that seem uh, that hearken to something that's being compromised in this format, and instead recombine them into something uh, that 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 is designed for this format. Where we're now we're just going to be sort of watching uh, a video screen, um, and uh, and in, in in many parts of the show that was not so hard, uh, particularly because in many parts of the show. Um, uh, even if someone's speaking text, we had video content. Like, and in, in, you can see that in you know in these various boxes in the show, uh, there was most often some kind of a screen, whether it was a projection screen or a TV or whatever. Um, and uh, and in some cases, the the equation was actually really simple for me, um, which was, oh, we created some really dynamic, interesting video content that ha that's happening on stage. And so that could be dropped. I could literally just go get that off of our research hard drive, drop that into Final Cut, and uh, and then sort of play with it as necessary. But it didn't require a lot of um, of brand new iteration on my part. Um, the reason I'm bringing up this section of the show is because in this section I was a little, you know, sort of creatively a little screwed because as you can see. Um, it's nothing but physical movement on stage. Oh, I think there's something I should have said before, uh, up until now. An agreement that we made as a company, something that we love doing as a company, is giving ourselves givens, right? Certain parameters that um, that certainly aren't unbreakable, but uh, but that we try to stick within because we believe that having limitations within your given process is actually um, a liberating thing. Is actually a thing that forces you to to come across. Um, newer and more exciting ways of, of problem solving, right? And, and thus more interesting results. And so one of the givens we all agreed about as I embarked, uh, embarked upon um, uh, editing this video was that whenever possible, and there were a couple of places where we ended up having to break this rule because otherwise it wouldn't really translate, but whenever possible, we didn't want to show you bodies. We didn't want to show you video of us doing stuff because then you're just watching video of theater. Um, but of course, as you just saw, this entire section, with perhaps the 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 exception of uh, the the hands on the screen, um, it's all movement. 
So suddenly I have, and I think this is one of the longest musical chunks in the entire show because it's really two songs back to back. Um, and you know, I think I think for a total of perhaps about five minutes, and uh, and that hand video, beautiful though it is, moves at a pace that's about like this. And so I'm not about to ask you, the audience, to sustain your interest, even as as you know, genius as my music is, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, of watching hands rubbing each other for five minutes. So now the question becomes, uh, what do I show you, right? Um, so this was a case where, uh, thankfully, because of the way that we, I think this is part of why Alex and I have been hearkening so much to, you might be asking like, why are we talking so much about the development of the piece? Uh, you know, way back, even before, before we, they were developing the digital version. And I think it's because truly, I think we're trying to get at the idea that all of these things are inherently linked. And so as part of that we have this hard drive it literally is like we refer to it as the remnant hard drive every one of our shows these days had one has one um and on that hard drive lives all of our research including documentation of every single one of the installations that anybody came up with during our three years of development it has the text and video and audio of any interview we conducted it has you know random pdfs and books and you know images image references you name it all of the research is on that hard drive um and that included as people iterated um their own installations uh, uh, during the, 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 at that three years of workshopping we did, it has all of the video from pieces that people built that didn't end up making it into the stage show. Um, and, uh, and rather than start trying, starting to try to shoot, you know, cause put it this way, I, I didn't have to go to that hard drive. I could have gone and um, and shot brand new content. Uh, we could have, you know, started whatever poking around on on uh, 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 what is the word I'm looking for, like royalty free video sites and 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 pulling content. You know, we could have been like, oh well, what if it was a, a toaster and go find me a video of a toaster, right? Um, but rather, the given I gave myself was let me see if I can, if, like all of the whatever content exists on that drive is there because it was it was curated to be, right? A company member found an impulse in all of our conversations about death and about what leave, what's, what remains and war and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, that content is there because that came from one of my collaborators, one of my fellow company members' uh, impulses. So why would I go scouring the infinite <laughs> the uh, universe of the internet, uh, when in fact I can go pull um, from a very particular curated set of material. So, um, so looking through it, uh, I found I actually I found a bunch of really great stuff that I was able to build the digital version of this piece out of. Um, and so I'm going to show you some of it, and then I'll show you what I how I put it all together. Um, so first of all. Um, well, yeah, let's just look at the ice reels. I don't really need to show you this, but it's just interesting just because it's pretty and I think you should see it. Um, which I'll also is... say just quickly while mm -hmm. you're at this moment, <clears throat> one of the interesting parts about the way this process worked, which is probably opposite, not probably, is opposite the way a lot of like film stuff works is that you were editing to my tracks, that I yes. sent you a mix down, like a very early mix. I was like, here it is, here's, here's the length. You can start cutting to this. I won't move anything. And then as Ada was finishing, versions, she would send them to uh, to me and to Ruben and to Justin Nestor, the co-artistic director. And then, of course, I'd be able to see picture and be like, oh, if you're going to do that, let me pan this a little bit over here. Let me add a something mm -hmm. here that goes with the video. And so like we started to really, it wasn't so much a, here's the final video score to this video. And it wasn't Ada being like, oh, well, I've got the finished audio tracks. Let me address them as best I can. It was really a back and forth of addressing different elements within the mixes. That that's a great point, Alex. I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, literally, sometimes like you would hand me the the the, the full audio track, I would edit a thing and send it back to you. And then sometimes they they ask then either from one of us or from Ruben, uh, you know, giving us notes as sort of like the director, um, uh, would be like, hey, Ada did a thing here. Alex, can you actually create a sound or move a sound to match up with the with the choice Ada made, or vice versa? Hey, Alex has this sound 
element that's uh, that's happening. Ada, can you match the crossfade between these two videos to interact with that element or something like that? So it really was, um, yeah, like a, a sort of cross pollinating at all moments. Um, so th here, this is just one uh, little thing that actually is not um, in the final video, but I just think is worth looking at, which is this is the beautiful footage we have of this interview. Um, so the 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 gentleman who's sitting a little uh, closer to the camera is the person we interviewed, um, and that's him literally for the first time ever. We obviously, we manipulated this a little bit, but speaking about the the harrowing experiences he had uh, fighting overseas, and that's his husband who's hearing all of it for the first time. So that was sort of the you know the genesis for for this piece um, or this piece of the piece, um, and. Uh, we also had the 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 existing given of um, of this video that Justin Nestor created for a different installation of his hands. So this is just Justin's hands. Um, uh, it's a very slow paced video. Uh, you can see like it sort of cross fades slowly between. And the way we sort of regarded this video was Ada, we're seeing a white screen right. Oh, now. why are you seeing a white screen? That's no fun. Let me try again. Oh, I see what I did. I shared a whiteboard instead. Uh huh. Now, great, thank you. Um, this is why it's good to tag team these things. <laughs> um, here we go. So Justin's hands, and you see it cross, slowly cross fades. And uh, we were sort of seeing this almost as uh, the way that you saw that that soldier sitting at the table and he's kind of he's literally has his arms out like this while he's talking and we all thought it was really interesting that in the video you could literally watch his hands, you know, kind of rub themselves and turn over and um, and and we thought his hands were incredibly interesting as you know sort of how they were telling the story of his trauma as he literally told the story of his trauma. So, um, so that's kind of the element that's uh, that's happening here. Um, obviously, that was on stage in the video that I showed. Um, so then I have all this space that I have to fill. Um, so uh, what I ended up finding was from a completely different installation that someone had done. And I'm actually having in this moment having trouble remembering whose it was. Um, but uh, I ended up finding that we had this footage on the drive of um of all of this uh let's see Bloop. of all of this lava all of this hot lava um uh kind of moving around and sort of slowly enveloping these uh these you know this greenery that had popped up around it i think it's footage of somewhere like hawaii or something like that um and uh and as we're as we were speaking of like, you know, in his text, he's talking about like, like very like, you know, the deepest uh, in, in, like impulses that we have as humans in a, in the setting of war about how you're broken down to to you know the 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 barest elements of yourself and and you're just there for survival and something about all of that I sort of found this footage and went. Got something about the like primordial nature of of this flowing rock and watching an element transform um, between forms was really speaking to the text to me. And then as I started manipulating it, um, almost almost like a almost trying to score my own song like a music video a little bit with with this footage, um, I I start I was scrubbing around in Final Cut and noticed. Uh, actually, no, that's not true. Ruben noticed. Um, that if you started playing it backwards, uh, the equation reverses itself and you're actually watching life be uncovered by the lava, um, which started being this really beautiful metaphor for, for watching uh, this man sort of find new life with his partner and in his partnership as he was revealing these deep, dark inner truths, almost removing, you know, these layers of, of um of secret secrecy and trauma and 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 watching you know something really beautiful blossom between them so so that became a huge element that i used um and it's truly an idea that i never would have thought of if i hadn't have gone straight to all of the research that the company had already did um 
And then another element in the, once it uh, hops into the Kate Bush part is uh, again, from another installation that did not make it into the original stage version of this show is our company member, Michael Liddick did this piece that was very, very personal um, where he shared um, uh, uh, some material, oops, uh, some material from uh, his own family's archives. So this is actually um, some old, uh, I don't know what this is. It's super eight footage, it, old actual film footage of this is literally our company member, like Michael Liddick as a baby and members of his family. I think this is him a little older, um, like hanging out at a picnic or something. I actually don't know. Um, I'll have to ask Mikey to tell me what's going on here. Um, but uh, as we get into the the Kate Bush song, the lyrics start becoming about like a little boy growing up and being sent off to war and potentially coming home dead and, and sort of the, the equation of like losing one's innocence and being sent off to uh, to commit violent acts in, in this otherwise innocent state. And so I found this, uh, this footage from, uh, from Michael, uh, and thought this was really speaking to that lyric in a beautiful way. And also to that text that Corey's saying of, um, of naming the different versions of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's, it sounded, you know, so to hear, so you can see how we're sort of triangulating these images, right? We have like Kate Bush speaking of sending a kid off to war. We have like footage uh, old footage of this child and we have, um, you know, the, the names for this disorder and we're sort of, and in no case are we saying, here's the literal story of what's happening. We're sort of presenting you with these images and letting you take them and, and let your brain do the, 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 the puzzling, uh, uh, of how to fit these pieces together in which you have a lot of agency to decide, to decide how this lands on you. Um, which is, which is also a, 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 a common pre COVID, um, tactic for theater me too and and in our creation process of like taking two disparate things and putting them next to each other and sort of both creating meaning forcing you to create meaning figuring out what this equation is um so this is this is in line with with many many years of of me too activity the the, the way that we'll talk about it oftentimes in rehearsal kind of the simple metaphor when we're when we're critiquing each other things that each other show is is we talk a lot about like um uh, the, the metaphor of like a connect the dots drawing, right? Which is like, uh, if I if if I need you to draw a giraffe, if I want you to draw a giraffe or something like a giraffe, and I put the dots really close together, well, why even bother connecting them? If I put them close enough together, you'll see it's a giraffe. Who cares? Uh, conversely, if I put them way far apart from each other and ask you to connect the dots, you end up with some kind of weird blob and you're like, I have no idea. The whole fun of connect the dots <laughs> is that you're going to connect them and reveal something that you couldn't see there before. Um, and so when, when we, when we're creating these sort of equations of placing images with intention with each other, that's, a, that's a shorthand that we'll use about when we're talking about it a lot is like you've put the dots a little too close together. You've put the dots a little far apart. Um, you know, we're, we're, tr we're looking for that sweet spot of feeling like I've had to do a, some work as a viewer to, uh, to, to pull everything together, to synthesize all of these images and information. Um, but not so much that I'm just lost. Right. Um, the, the, the other element that I'll show you is I found, uh, again, on the hard drive from somebody else's piece, uh, uh, installation um, was these old like 60s recruitment films. Um, whoop. Uh, I feel like these were a, a JN special. Uh, I think so too. Uh, yeah, I think these got pulled for yeah something that Justin made. Uh, this one's called The Big Picture Drill Sergeant. <laughs> um, and it's literally this recruitment film where it's like, it's a kind of all about like your first 90 days in the military. And as I was sort of scrubbing through this, I noticed that every so often, let me see if I can find one. Um, they'd have these close-ups of like these drill sergeants or otherwise like high, higher up ranking, um, where he, he would just stop and like, just sort of stare into the camera with like longing eyes. Um, I feel like there's more over here. We'll see them in the actual thing. Yeah. Like, you know, and I, I just, I just, and so that started speaking to me um uh intention with the with the with Michael Liddick's baby footage um so so that became another uh uh point to triangulate with everything else with all those other elements I've mentioned um 
of we're looking at a baby, but we're seeing the faces of older men appear and we're hearing about names of their post-traumatic stress and we're hearing this vocal about sending your kid off to war. So so we're creating this this this, this almost this sort of like uh, emotional taste, right? For for you to for you to sit in. Um so uh so all this is to say, I'm gonna show you uh, what 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 we made uh in a sec. Um but uh is that when you're I, I think the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that when you're taking an existing piece and translating it to um to a different format, it really the 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 the, the problem solving of of doing that transfer shouldn't just be about you know, creating a one to one equation, right? The the problem solving is actually a, a hugely creative pro, uh, process in and of itself. And, um, you know, I'm depending on, you know, what piece you're trying to do this with this, the answer to this question can manifest in, uh, you know, 100 million different ways. Um, but this is a way that we as a company embraced the problem that was given us um and ended up using it to sort of uh uh even though it's technically in a, you know a reimagining of the same piece to let the piece sort of grow and it sort of transpose itself and 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 metamorphose into the thing that we ended up showing uh, as part of new york theater workshop season so um uh, with my last few minutes here before we uh, go uh, let y'all ask some questions and stuff um, uh, is I'd love to show you the result of what I was talking about. Um, I'll also jump in while <clears throat> Ada is, is getting queued up here to say that the worst day in the theater in creating Remnant for 2018 for me was the day that Ada brought in her fully produced tracks having worked on them <laughs> at home in her studio because she was like okay here you go like here's a jump drive and I listened to them and I was like I have to make the rest of the show sound as good as these tracks now <laughs> like she just set the bar so high reading these and I was like oh god <laughs> like how do I match this <laughs> you're too kind <laughs> calls them as a season um so I will, uh, I'm going to play this and, and I, and I will disclaimer this by saying, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk you through this. So if you want to see it without me yapping through it, then, and you haven't watched the show yet, go watch the show. Cause that link will still be active for, um, another week or so. Um, here we go. So I'm actually going to play this one with your permission, Alex. I know I've gone like a teensy bit over, but, uh, let me play this one in its entirety. I think it's about four and a half minutes. Um, that throws me right back in the scenario where I have my weapon laying right next to me. So we're coming out of I know I Michael speaking right the text so of the interview that around, we did you know, with that soldier. Waiting for orders, and then I see him. I guess the so here's the song I wrote, also using that text. Here's the image from that other piece that Alex showed with the, the piece of fruit in front of his chest. I just keep telling myself that, you know, you're fine, you're all right, you're right here, you're at home. I guess the words before they so now a choice I made is as the music is sort of growing and starting to take over the space, I let more of these hands overlay with each other. Now, back you know, there's to the something end. to worry about. I guess that, like, you can see that I'm I'm trying to do that triangulation do. as Every the thing progresses here. The Look at these hands. I've Look at the fruit on his chest. Hear what he's saying. Listen to the lyrics of this song, right? Almost baking like a little layer cake. And now here comes this element of the lava. I say constantly that I don't dream. remember the last time I had a dream. Number one question. Number one question. And so 
now in the stage version, there's going to be this sort of like beat drop that, that happens in a second, and which was a huge physical him. moment. It was when that TV not got pushed. There was a big us. light cue change. That's all I want. The question became, how could I the most part, reflect that here? I don't dream. And now we enter a new phase. <laughs> Simple things. I literally color shifted the footage, sped it up. But now you can tell that a shift has happened. Man. 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 His friendship is deep. Loyalty has For he is indeed. Man. So that's the end of my song. And now it's going to transition into the Kate kid. Bush song, which again, Before on stage, there was a lighting shift, the physicality after. changed, Corey started walking out to lean back in that chair. Here comes they this called it soldiers. And now I'm bringing in Michael's footage and the footage from those weird uh, recruitment films. Hero. And I'm looking for places where I, I, it, it, it was a happy accident that like we're looking at an seven. older woman right when she says mommy's hero, right? Mommy that I, I saw those things land in proximity and made the conscious choice of scooting them together. So that now these things that, you know, obviously Mikey's family didn't create this knowing it would ever be put to music. <laughs> but somehow these elements end up speaking to each other. 1914, and I'm seeing what I can do to support that conversation and, and, and illuminate Didn't it further. The the 1918, they called it shell shock. Never had a proper education. 1945, they called it battle fatigue. Didn't even make it to his and so the music all up until that, this point heart. has been sort of languid, and now we're bringing in this little subdivided beat back in, right? So now I took this part of uh, Michael's footage and wounds. sped it up. So that I'm, I'm letting the image echo what's happening sonically. 1975, stress response syndrome. Nineteen eighty, post-traumatic stress disorder. 1991 they called it post traumatic stress why did you join the military so there you go and then it goes on into another section but so that's how uh that's how we arrived <laughs> at, at that at, at this section and so i basically now think i i did that i played that game for an hour and a half of content right of what's salvageable from the thing we made and then what uh what can i um you know, uh, used to, uh, to, to, to speak to it with. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, I think, um, I think that's sort of the end of my chunk of time. Oh no, I just saw your note, Alex. I hope you could no, understand me during that. <clears throat> we could, um, it was like when the base kicked in, it was, you, you were fighting a little bit, but I think in general, I, I think you came across. Sorry. It's so hard to tell <laughs> when yeah. you're on this end. Yep. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah. Um, so what we'd love to do now and let, you know, jump in if you, if you've got anything to add, Alex, um, but, uh, we have, uh, about 10, 10, 15 minutes left. And, uh, if you have any questions for us, we'd love to try and answer them for you. Um, and, uh, and also just to say thank you for, for coming and listening to us, uh, speak about our process on this piece. Um, and perhaps in this moment, I'll, well, you know, while we wait to see if there's, uh, any questions coming in. Oh, here we go. Actually. Um, could you speak to the creation of the web platform and what that collaboration looked like? Did you all have any experience with web development and how was it built to include your new adapted materials? So, think, yeah, so good to answer the, um, the, the, the creation of the web platform was, was in conjunction with, with, um, uh, person by the name of Alex Reeves, who works uh, at a studio called Moonpool, runs runs a web development studio called Moonpool. And uh, Moonpool created the Theater Me Too website, um, the revamp that we recently did. Um, and so we um, already had a working relationship with this, with this person, with this, with this company. So we, we brought them into the fold. But prior to the conversations with them, 
there was a long conversation with all of us about like, well, what does this interactivity want to be? What does this website want to look like? Um, how, like, even like, is a website the right thing? Like that wasn't necessarily a foregone conclusion that it, this was going to be presented um, over a website. We weren't exactly sure what it would be. I mean, early on, you know, it could have been a six episode podcast. It could have been just about anything. Um, and, and ultimately we decided that having some sort of ability to create a theatrical experience via tickets and opening up the website at a certain time and that sort of thing was important to us. And so um, it did become about a about creating a website. And then it was about all of the things that come into um, uh, the design of anything, thinking about intent and um, user interaction and the content that would be on there and best ways to interact with the space, um, which then got translated into, uh, into code by Alex Reeves. And there were certainly some things that we wanted um, that were going to be really hard in terms of, you know, how to display the video, how to present the icons for people to click on and sort of move through the experience. Um, you know, there were like, we didn't want there to be player pause buttons necessarily. We wanted just sort of the whole thing to start and, um, and, and in a way, like kind of remove some audience agency, not make it a Netflix situation where you can be like, oh, I'm just going to hit pause and get the pizza or like go to the bathroom. Like we want to try and imbue this with a sense of um, um, intentionality. Like we want you to sit and experience this the way you would experience a piece of, of theater. And, you know, I think that uh, as we've all sort of watched our attention spans decline in the past year, I think that is sometimes a bit of a heavy ass, but we also knew like, okay, well, it's 20 minute segments. So like, it's not it's not huge. Um, we debated on whether to put a progress bar. So you had some idea of where you were in the experience or, you know, Me Too has a long, long love of time code. We were thinking about putting time code over the whole, uh, whole thing. Um, and so it really became about us um, also like sourcing other websites, you know, going to somebody's website, be like, oh, I love the interaction where actually like, you know, you scroll sideways. That's so cool. Can we do that? Like, turns out we can. Um, but then, you know, it was like, okay, well, if we're going to use I think it's Vimeo is the back end for the video. Um, if we're going to use Vimeo, the API for Vimeo allows a certain amount of interconnectivity between a website and the, the Vimeo servers, but not all of them. Um, there were some early on things once we started doing the rollout where we realized like we all were accessing it on Chrome and Firefox. And actually Safari is a very different experience. And that was a problem that you can't really control for. I mean, there are, you know, you sort of think, well, it's like, it's a video, like how, you know, how many different options are there? It turns out that actually there's a lot of accessibility um, issues or questions that come up when you're talking about presenting uh, a visual and audio experience um, in terms of like people were going to want, you know, we had to be okay with the fact that people were going to watch it, you know, on a phone with, with listening to it on these speakers. And, you know, I, I shed a single tear and I die a little inside every single time I think about somebody watching this on a phone, like on a subway. Um, without headphones but um you know it's something that you can only do so much you sort of make is sort of like mixing an album like you mix it on the best monitor speakers that you have knowing that somebody's going to listen to it on ipod you know ipod headphones or or in a car stereo so so we we tried to make the product the best possible and then sort of give disclaimers and be like hey really want you to put on headphones really think you should open up chrome to access this it will be best if you do these things but knowing that that's not that's not necessarily an option for everybody and that you know um even if it turns out to be an experience that wasn't exactly what we wanted and were hoping uh just the the fact that we were able to share the experience with with a large larger group of people um seemed salient and and, and resonated with us as an option um so i i hope that answers the the question um, we have a couple others over here in the in the Q and A oh, window. Oh, so we do. We sure do. Um, uh, uh, Sean is asking about um, how much consideration there was given to the number of performers uh, to the number of performers' voices to use in the digital version of the show as opposed to direct audio sources from interviews. Um, and uh, I, I think I think uh, you know I, I I imagine you have a lot to say about that in particular, Alex. Um, I think, uh, that weirdly or not weirdly, but I think has, it's has, has roots in our processes as a company, as we've developed it, um, over time, which is, uh, we have an interest in our bodies and our voices becoming almost, um, transmitters 
uh, of information. Um, and, uh, and sometimes uh, it actually, it actually began uh, uh, as a case where, where uh, back in, in our, in the, in the, the piece that Alex talked about years ago uh, called Juarez, where we had this interview text that um, uh, sometimes we actually didn't have permission or the ability to use the original source of the audio. Sometimes the audio was, uh, because of where we recorded it in the field, was deeply compromised. Um, you know, we had to, we met up with a person, it was a loud restaurant and, you know, all the audio was like this and couldn't, it's, it probably sounded like me screaming over the video a minute ago. Um, uh, uh, and in some cases, uh, a another thing to solve was, uh, straight up, it was, it was in Spanish and we had the audio translated, um, for us so we could, you know, create with it. Um, but, uh, but so in, in these different, uh, cases, we, we, we also had an interest in that show of, of not ever, um, embodying character on stage. Um, so unlike, you know, perhaps some other versions of documentary theater, uh, you know, or like an, like an Anna Zephyr Smith kind of thing, like, uh, uh, we weren't trying to, for a number of reasons, you know, say that I am this school teacher who I'm, you know, now talking to you as, but rather that the language of this person is, is traveling through me out of my mouth to your ears, um, and, and sort of putting our own bodies on stage as conduits for uh for information and for voice and and um and so on and so uh bec i would say that because we did a similar thing in this piece um uh that one of our givens when translating it to the digital form was not to now go back and try to source some of that original audio again but rather preserve that aspect of uh of the thing that we mounted in person at me 2580 um uh, which is that, for example, like there was a moment where you're hearing, um, uh, uh, like a, a, part like a, a well-known scientist speak on something, but we're trying to not have you get sort of bogged down in the person, you know, the actual like personality or, or other information about that science, but really just live in the information that he, uh, is, um, is, is communicating, um, and so to hear it come out of the voice of a company member sort of disembodies that text in places, it lets it sort of sit in context amongst um, text that maybe we got from like someone's mom. Um, and those things can now sit with equal value. Um, it's almost a way of like democratizing that text rather than being like, well, here's a famous scientist and now here's somebody's mom, you know. Um, Alex, what do, you, do, you, do you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, I, I think that's, I think that is fairly, um, yeah, I know. I, I, I don't, I don't really, I think that is a fairly complete answer. Um, I mean, the <laughs> quality of audio is definitely, is definitely a question mark. And also just, you know, we, there, uh, the, um, many of us are big fans of, uh, Laurie Anderson and you can sort of, the, the me too, uh, delivery tends to be a little like, a little bit like a Laurie Anderson piece. <laughs> and so I think that there's some sort of recontextualization that, that also goes on when, when delivering, when delivering text. Cause yeah, cause at the end of the day, like we're not, it's not, it's not an academic exercise, right? It, it, it it's, it's an emotional one. And I, I, cause then it sort of begs the question of like, why have performers at all? Why not just give you an archive of research material? And the truth is because, uh, because we are, I, I, like, I, we do want you to hear, um, text come out of, 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 of 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 one of our own voices with our own point of view and our and our own uh you know in relation to the things that we're presenting around it whether it's images happening concurrently or in sequence and and um and i i think we have an, an interest in 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 how our physical bodies and voices um uh like i think i used the word before act act as conduits in that equation um uh let's see oh god we are, we're we're basically at time um, yeah i'd i'd love like to actually more. i'd love to address darren's uh question in the in the chat um yeah darren darren westward to to the oh. panelist um is there a form of process the company uses when you're collaborating together uh when you're giving notes and discussing each other's work uh a la liz lerman's creative response work which i think is an excellent question and the answer is a no 
<laughs> we, 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 I think it's just sort of something that's involved and like, we, um, you know, we've certainly had processes like you are in a very um, sort of open and fragile and delicate state sometimes when you present your work because you care about it and, and you want people to get something out of it. Um, and, uh, and feelings get hurt. Absolutely. Like there are times when like, you're like, I think this thing is really cool. And everybody's like, ah, it doesn't really do it. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, but there's so, I mean, you know, we're a company that have, like, we've been with the company for 15 years. I think pretty much every company member at this point has been around for at least five or so. And so there's a, there's a long history of, of, um, of relationships within the company. And so there's a lot of care there and you can usually see, um, you know, there's, there's always something, I mean, hopefully there's pretty much always something there that like grabs and resonates with the, um, with the rest of the company. And so then it's just about like, uh, you know, sort of like, uh, what is it like compliment critique compliment. You're supposed to like bookend your, your critique with, with saying nice things. So you're like, Oh, I thought that was really cool. I didn't totally understand that middle part, but really I thought that the music was excellent, you know, sort of like finding your way through that. Um, and, and oftentimes it's more a question about the ideas underlying and what we're trying to say with a piece because it, because we're not text based because we're not coming at this from anything. It's very much a company driven of like, okay, well, we have this topic. What within this topic is actually what we want to talk about. Um, there's a, there's a, a section of, um, couple of interviews that are in the piece that are uh, members of the military who have survived sexual abuse. And that was from one company member being like, I think this is really important. I think we need to talk about this. I'm gonna go do some interviews. And she kept bringing it into the room and we're all like, I don't know if it fits. I don't know. But the more she brought it in, we're like, yeah, okay, this is okay. We're, we're finding a way to, to integrate this. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's just about, it's, it's less about the presentation of the work and whether or not like the video screen is in the correct place or the mix was off. Cause these things are usually created in the course of like a day or two, you sort of, um, you know, uh, throw it, th throw it out there and sort of see what sticks kind of thing. Um, and so they're not, um, they're just sort of trying to balance crafted enough to get the point across and not so overly crafted that you spent two weeks making one 30 second thing and then nobody likes it and you're like well so much for that um so uh so it's usually the conversation is around the underlying ideas and what you're trying to communicate um possibly more so than the um than the than the physical piece itself in in all of its manifestations we have so many good questions in here <laughs> there's so many more i think we um i don't know are, are we have we have we hit time or can we, do you think we can, can we do one more? Can we keep going? Will you let us? <laughs> you are, you're still muted, I think. Ah, rats, Zoom. Aha. <laughs> do you think after a year, I would totally remember <laughs> to turn on my mic? <laughs> I mean, don't forget, I forgot to share a sound, but when, when we were in our like pre making sure everything worked phase, I was like, do you guys hear that? <laughs> and it was like, no, was like, it's because I didn't share audio. I'm a sound designer. This is going well. It's great how <laughs> your brain just turns to mush. I'm, I'm like, tell me there's 30 people on the other end. And I'm like, <laughs> um, unfortunately, we are at time. However, okay. I want to put in the chat. Oh, and Alex, I think you're going to be quite pleased with the slide. You'll see. <laughs> just wait. Uh, I will put in the chat. Um, there we go. So I have um, Aiden and Alex's contacts and social media there. So if you want to continue the conversation, please follow them as well as Theater Me Too. And, um, and also, please, we are spotlighting today Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. The link is right there. Please donate. And, you know, I, this was like really cool to watch because I have had the, the pleasure of I'm going through the digital remnant and seeing how you all work through this process as you know many of us have been trying to it's it's so great to hear you as you as artists going through step by step of how do you translate the choices on stage that process and find something uh comparable to to have that same effect in the digital space and that was awesome so well, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for your generosity artistry and being in um just being in community with us 
And I'm just like so freaking happy that you're in our community. I was like, yes, this is kick ass. <laughs> and we are we are so happy. I mean, yeah. Theater Me Too has a long history with New York Theater Workshop from from 15 plus years ago. So it's, it's always been an artistic home for us. So thank you for having yeah. us. Thank you for I having think us. I think Ruben is in the audience. And so, yeah, I could, I, I could just imagine like cheer, a little <laughs> cheer. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I'll say uh, uh, any of the questions that we didn't get to, um, uh, I, I'm going to speak on your behalf as well, but I'd say I, I uh, please hit either of us up through our Instagrams um, that we have listed there. You can message us and uh, like, for example, I know I already have a thread going with, with Billy who asked the question. So um, uh, I, I will uh, answer your question on there when I get a sec. Um, and please uh, check out Theater Me Too's website, uh, theatermeetoo.org. Um, uh, it's another place you can make a donation if you'd like to support another yeah. nonprofit arts organization. Um, and uh, <laughs> we're <laughs> absolutely and New York Theater Workshop, of course. And um, uh, we're in the development of, of another piece that we're going to uh, debut hopefully this fall. Um, that's in, in, in probably, and so Remnant 3.0 is sort of this next piece that we are creating both as a in-person, whatever that means, and also a digital pairing, digital atemporal kind of piece. So we're sort of taking everything we learned on making this remnant and applying it to our next piece, which will be around, yeah, late August, early September. So absolutely. Oh, and and the, the final little plug is also that we right now, uh, during as we, you know, wind down, hopefully, you know, God willing out of the pandemic um, uh, uh, is not so much a thing. But uh, as as things reopen, uh, we have a physical space in Gowanus, Brooklyn, um, called Me Too 580. It's where we uh, premiered this piece, we, we host um, a number of different programs there. And uh, we have guest artists and we have other companies uh, premiere shows there. Um, so as things reopen, come visit us. Too, yeah, come say hi. Please. Um, and we're, we're always happy to see folks and answer questions. And, and we love engaging with our larger, um, you know, city community and artistic community. So so don't be a stranger. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming in, tuning in and staying like being part of this masterclass. Thank you again, Ada, Alex, Theater Me Too. I see Ruben is like saying hurrah. <laughs> Hi, Ruben. In the chat. And for those that we have more um, free programming coming up, I just want to give a shout out. On April 14th, we have Nav uh, Navigating Asian, Amer um, Asian America Theater and Activism, April 14th at 5 p.m., as well as our monthly open mic night with Poetic Theater Productions on Thursday, April 22nd at 7 p.m. And more to share. And so just wait, Alec, I was, I am very excited. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Woo! Yes. <laughs> so much prettier than what I made. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's lovely. I was like, I was like, oh yeah, Alex, let me, let me put it in. Let me put it in. I could do this. I could do this. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much, friends. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you, you so everybody. Much. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming.